Well, hello there. Welcome to Healthy Cooking with your friendly Italians. I'm Jim Bureau. I'm Marilyn Bureau. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, food. We're going to give you uh, insights in, uh, into some recipes. And right now we're traveling throughout Europe, and specifically Italy right now. And last time we were with you, we were talk- We were in Siena and the Palio, and we're going to move north, northeast, up through to Venice, which is in the uh, northern part of Italy at the north end of the Adriatic. And we're going to take a couple of side trips to Florence, where we've been before, and Poggio Bunsi. You probably never heard of Poggio Bunsi, and uh, I will explain it to you. That's an interesting story. <laughs> so, so first, let's talk about uh, Florence. Florence, and specifically about a dish that comes out of Florence that is very famous. And Which it is, is, and it's not typical of most Italian cooking. It no. really is not because it's a huge piece of meat, basically. This is a hunk of meat that is two inches thick, and it's called steak a la Florentine. And it is the epitome of eating a steak. It is the best possible way to eat a steak. And the steak in 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 uh, Florence is a porterhouse. It's about one and a half to two inches uh, in, in, in thickness. And Marilyn, it, the beef is called? Chianina. I think it's actually white. I mean, it, it's a particular brand or a, a, a kind of um, beef uh, that it's only in that area that they raise these cows. And they, uh, it, they, they, they slaughter them at a fairly young age, not at a calf's age, but a little older. Very, very succulent meat. And uh, it really is the epitome of, of good uh, steak eating. And I thought with the grilling season coming along, we should we should give you a recipe and give you some hints on how to how to cook it, uh, how to serve it, and how to know when it is at your uh, whether you want it rare, medium, or well done. Uh, there's a restaurant up in New York <clears throat> that is considered by some the finest steakhouse in the country, Peter Luger's. Right, and they have an incredible incredible steaks too. And that's in Brooklyn, right underneath the... Uh, Brooklyn Bridge. Bro- no, Williamsburg Bridge. Williamsburg Bridge, right. right. And they serve one cut of meat, a porterhouse. And you can get it for one, two, three, or four. Uh, and it's just how big it gets is how, uh, is how many it serves. And the way that they cook it and serve it is the steak a la Florentine way. Now, mind you, if you go there, number one... It's going to cost you probably around seventy or seventy-five dollars right. a person, just for the steak, much less anything else. They don't take any credit cards. There's no reservations, uh, but uh, it's good. What I would suggest, if you wanted to go there, if you're in New York, go there for lunch. Right. You can get in for lunch. Get a hamburger. Hamburgers are wonderful. But anyway, so uh, it, it it epitomizes what steak a la Florentine is. We have to also mention a little story that our grandson, who is as thin as a rail and is, a, is 11 years old, loves steak. He has eaten everybody under the table, both in Florence and at Peter Luger, eating this steak that he absolutely loves. <laughs> I, ordered, I ordered a steak for three, two grown-ups and my grandson. Mm-hmm. And the person that was with us, what are you bu- getting a steak for three? You got this little kid. How, what? I said, trust me. He ate his portion of the steak, and he ate my portion of the steak. So, yeah. uh, all right, let's talk about uh, how to how to cook a uh, steak a la Florentine. You're going to take a porterhouse, and you're going to get it cut about inch and a half to two inches right. in, in thickness, and you're going to rub it with some oil, and you're going to sprinkle it with some fresh cracked pepper. And you're going to let it set at room temperature for about a half an hour. Okay. Now you're going to you can either put it on the grill or you can put it on top of top of the stove in a in a sauté pan. Get that nice and hot, and put it in there and cook it about eight minutes per side. And I'm going to tell you how to know 
when to take it off after I finish telling you how we go through this thing. You remove it from the heat, you season it with salt, let it set for about five minutes. Yes. Okay? The setting is very important. You gotta let it because set. Because otherwise you're gonna lose all the juiciness of it. Right. And then you're gonna slice it off the bone and slice it into strips. And then you're gonna brush it with a mixture of olive oil, chopped rosemary, chopped garlic, and parsley, and serve it. And it, it, is a, it is the way to eat steak. It is the way that Peter Luger does it. Now, I told you, how do you, how do you know when it's done? How do you know whether, you, uh, whether it's rare, medium, or God forbid, well done? But Jim but, has a very good method here, yeah. that's easy. See my hand? Close your hand like this. Don't, don't tighten it, just put your thumb right there and press right there like that. In between your thumb and your forefinger. That's rare. You want medium? Bring your hand over. Don't close it or tighten it, just bring it over, touch there, that's medium. And as I said, God forbid you want it well done, clench your fist touch there. That's well done. It'll be much firmer. So it's So from, it's real. It's, it's real from easy. coming from soft to really firm. Right, right. But the secret is letting it set beforehand, letting it set after it's cooked, and a simple uh, olive oil with a little rosemary and uh, and garlic on it and you've got a steak. Now mind you, buying a porterhouse steak uh, in this day and age can be extremely expensive. We enjoy sirloins. Our, with our, when we were big meat eaters, big beef eaters, we would buy one every Saturday from, Gus, from Gus's Meat Market, and we would buy it about an inch and a half or two inches thick, and we would have sirloin steak. Well, that's when we had all of our children at home, too. So, so I would suggest, I, and I think, Marilyn, don't you think the flavor of a sirloin steak. Oh, it's very good. Yep. It, it is, but the, the you know, if you have want to really treat yourself at a restaurant either in Florence or go to Peter Luker's, I mean, <laughs> it's something that you should enjoy. <laughs> the other thing Jim does when he uses some of the herbs is he uh, mentioned uh, the oregano, and he's been using the oregano in a bunch, and then you just roll it instead of using just dried oregano. You can buy it already dried, that it's like the flowers in, in the stems. and Yeah, instead of buying a little can or a little bottle of dried oregano, you can go to, you can go to stores, uh, there's, there's some- Particularly specialty specialties. Italian stores would have it. And it's already on the vine. It's dried and it's on the vine. And so now when you want to use it, you turn it over, and there's a, it's usually in a plastic type of thing, and just shake it. And when you shake it, some of the oregano leaves will go out, and they taste so much better that way. Uh, there's a place called Shamir's in Syracuse, which is a, uh, a, a, over next to uh, the theater. Uh, that, uh, that Syracuse had, Stage. Syracuse yes. Stage. So you, you use that. So uh, you should try that. All right, now we talk, we're gonna, we're gonna leave Florence and we're gonna go to Poggia Bunsi. Now you're gonna say, why are we going to Poggia and Bunsi? And how did we ever get to Poggia Bunsi? And why did we get to Poggia Bunsi? <laughs> Which is basically an industrial city, so. Well, we were, one, one Saturday we were going to a polio, not in Siena, but someplace else. It was a different polio. Different polio. Marilyn, uh, said she had to go to the bathroom, which she does a lot. <laughs> and she went in and she had to walk down uh, some a gravel piece and she fell. She was gone a long time. I didn't know where she was. I was getting worried. Finally, somebody came to, came to me and started to speak in a broken uh, English that my wife had fallen down. She had broken her leg. So this was a very interesting experience because they have to take you by ambulance to the local hospital. In the local hospital, the closest hospital happened to be Pochabonsi, right. which we knew nothing about, obviously. And she ends up with a compound fracture. They have to operate. And uh, so we, we said, uh, we talked to them, and we, I talked to our, our doctor. He says, fine, they're, they're great doctors over there. Going to. So I said, okay, let's do it. So then they said, well, everybody's on vacation. We're on vacation for the month of August. We'll do it in September. What? 
So I thought it was going to be there forever. Right. But the, the good news is that I was very interested in the culture of Italy and how people dealt with things. And it was really interesting that the culture of their hospitals and those kinds of things are completely different uh, than ours. Obviously, they're on socialized medicine. Thank but God. you know what? <laughs> it worked. And it was really interesting. The people were absolutely wonderful. And one of the biggest things, getting back to food, is that they feel that you must be fed well to, to heal. So they would bring you cafe and, and rolls and wine. You even got wine in the hospital. They were very concerned about Jim So th when he was there because he had to help with everything. They brought him food. Uh, and then the family, and I was in a room with some older woman, a woman that had broken her hip that was in the 80s, and her family were very concerned about it. And they were so concerned about the food that they brought us food. So we were very well, t both of us were very well taken care of in this Italian hospital. The point we're trying to make is, again, <laughs> the food, the food, right? <laughs> And every morning they would come in with a pitcher of wine. When they found I, w I was there, there would be two pitchers of wine, <laughs> all right, every, every single day. And you'd have uh, melon and prosciutto, gnocchis, veal, oh, salty, Oh, very good food. I mean, Amazing that high. they could come up with the food that they did. And then to make it even better, I said, well, what are we going to do? We're going to have to stay here for a month. I went to talk to the head man who was called... Uh, il professore, il professore. Il dottore. Uh, because he was really the head of of the uh, unit that you know took care of uh, broken bones and that kind of thing. So, and come to find out, he was this, from the same town that my father was from. So he says to me, "For you, we open up for your wife to operate tomorrow morning." So they opened it up, and they, so now I got to pay for this thing. And this, I, I wanted to throw this in because of this. The, the type of medicine and how much it costs over there. So they said, okay. Uh, I says, I got to know how much it's going to cost so I can get the money. So uh, they said it's going to be one and a half million lira. At that day, in those days, there were lira, and not euros. Major, yeah, <laughs> a million and a half lira. Sounds like a lot of money, right? $3,000. Now, for $3,000, you get uh, 28 days in the hospital. It didn't make any difference how long you You no. couldn't stay over 28. 28 days. You can stay 28. It covered the, the operation, the doctor, the food, everything. The whole inclusive thing was $3,000. Think of what that would cost here in the United States, huh? So we did that. Well, we should get on. We should travel beyond that. I finally got home. Everything was fine, and my leg is fine. They did an absolutely beautiful job. Yes. So <laughs> i got to say one more thing. Though. You know, they, one thing you had to do, you had to clean uh, the towels and uh, all of her. The well, you had to bring everything. That, you know, the people that we were traveling with helped us. We were on a part of a tour. They helped us. You have to bring your own dishes. This is part of keeping their expenses down is that you bring all these things. And uh, so they were very helpful, yes. Yeah, and I had to bring it to the, into the hotel room and clean it all and bring it right. back. Right, he had to all help right. out. That was, that was not good. <laughs> so. All right, we're going to go to Venice. We're going to travel all the way up to the north uh, part of Italy in Venice. Now, Venice <coughs> is a, a, a city that is completely it's and completely utterly different. different. Uh, it, in the summer, it, it's crowded, it stinks. There's floods uh, that go on, and people have to put uh, plastic over their shoes. There's a you get, you always get lost in 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 uh, Venice, but all in all, Venice is still a wonderful, wonderful place. Well, it's all you know. It's all canal travel. There are no there are no other means of transportation besides the gondola and the water. I mean, it's all water transportation. And the reason why we had gone to Venice was we had a wedding, our son and, son and daughter in law got married in Florence and they were had a hotel where they were gonna spend their honeymoon in Venice and there was as as is usual in Italy, they had a train strike and they could not get to to Venice and get back and get their plane out of Rome. So we ended up taking their 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 honeymoon their room. and we went we, we went to uh, Venice and we had a had a wonderful time in Venice. And I've got a recipe for, it, there's a lot of seafood in Venice, okay? Well, basically it is seafood and pasta because, again, there's no land, you know, there's no land around there. So 
typically Italian, they eat what is local. So right. local is, is fish. So let's talk about a fish, uh, something simple with a fish. A Venetian grilled swordfish. Now you can use swordfish, you could use shark, you could use halibut, any kind of a steak, tuna. A, a little, yes, a little meatier kind of fish rather than like a flounder or, or, you know, haddock or anything and like that. And you're not going to cook it that long. You're going to, uh, you're going to grill it about a two inch, uh, about a half an inch thick piece of, of fish, about two minutes per side. Uh, and uh, you're going to uh, stick, when you, after it's cooked, stick some holes in it and pour over a combination of salt and lemon juice uh, till it dissolves and some, that oregano I was talking about, you put that in there and you pour it over the top, slice it, put it over a bed of arugula and, uh, and it's done. Now, how much simpler can you get it? And it is wonderful and make sure you don't overcook it. Again, you can put it on the grill, uh, you could, uh, or you could put it in, uh, on top of the stove. Great, great dish. And I can tell you a story about uh, when we were there. We had gone to the Guggenheim Museum, and I found this wonderful little seafood restaurant there. So I said, Marilyn, when we finish with the Guggenheim, we're going to go back and have lunch at the seafood restaurant. So we did. little old lady came on over, and she started telling us about all the things that they had uh, uh, f to eat that day. Well, you have to remember, Jim gets very carried away. He thinks he can speak Italian, so <laughs> <laughs> I'll let him finish the story. He thinks he See? can. <laughs> I'm, I'm answering this woman, See, si, every time she was, what I'm trying to tell her, yes, I understand what you're talking uh, about. She's thinking that when I say si, she, w I want to order it. We ordered, we, I did, everything on the menu. I kept pushing him and saying, you're ordering the whole thing. He said, oh, no, no, no. So no, I, no, you no, know, no I'm not going to have a, this huge argument with my husband in the middle of an Italian restaurant. So. Make, a, make a long story short, the bill came for lunch for the two of us. It was $250. <laughs> but <laughs> we're, it was an experience. Yeah, we'll, it we'll, typically, we'll it, remember. It, right. <laughs> So anyways, uh, that was her story about Venice. I want to give you another uh, simple, simple dish that is served in, in, in Venice. It's a dessert that is so, so easy to make. And it is rigotta and coffee. And you're going to take some rigotta. You're going to put this in a food processor. And you're going to put some sugar. And you're going to mix that all up. And you're going to add some uh, espresso to it. And, and again, uh, mix it all up. Let it put in the refrigerator for 24 hours. You want to get fancy when it comes out, you can put some coffee beans on top. And let me tell you, they're right here in Seneca Falls, the regatta and the espresso is available right down at Noni's. And uh, you can go down there and get this wonderful creamy res uh, regatta and a cup of, uh, uh, of uh, espresso. And they're going to have instant espresso there too, which if you wanted to do it that way. So you can do that. So uh, that's a good dish. Got some other dishes we're not going to be able to. Uh, well, let me get to this one. Yes, omelet. one more. Omelet. This, this is the quintessential Italian dish because omelets, or what they call frittata, are, is something that you can make fresh or you can use any kind of leftover you have. So uh -huh. they do use them. It's there. Instead of serving sandwiches, to, for a quick meal, frittatas are very common. And they're you and the Italians will eat it for lunch or for dinner. They'll make a frittata, uh, and the whatever's in the refrigerator they're going to use, and they'll give a salad, and that's what they have. And they, they, you know, they'll use a pan like this. This is a caffeine which I buy out at the outlet mall at the uh, chef's outlet. Works out very well. Put whatever, heat the thing up. Put whatever ingredients you want in there: sausage, potatoes, blah blah blah. Uh, cook it. Make some uh, eggs with some uh, with some milk. Pour that over the top, and stir it around. When it when it starts to set, put it in the oven. Put the broiler on the top. When it starts to get brown, bring it out. By this time, the egg mixture has pulled away from these wonderful pans. All you have to do is go like this, and it pours right out the whole omelet right onto your dish, and it's ready to serve. 
You don't have to flip it. You don't have to do anything like that. It takes really longer. Nice. It takes longer than flipping. I mean, you're talking probably uh, overall, you know, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes by the time you finish this frittata. But it's very good. And uh, you know, again, at this time of the year, as you're starting to get into fresh vegetables, for some reason, I love asparagus with eggs. So an asparagus for We're talk about some more asparagus. Too. I got a I got asparagus soup to die for. You're going to have that. Then maybe the next time. I don't right. know. So uh, try it. Buy one of these. These are wonderful pans and use them. Make sure you get a pan that's got a metal metal end to it, so it does it when you put it in the oven. It's not going to melt on you like a rubber r rubber handle. So buy buy one of these. Okay, and uh, enjoy yourself and. Next time we get together, we're going to go from northern Italy, we're going to go south, and we're going to go to Parma, and I am going to give you a recipe from a good Italian person that lives here in Seneca Falls for making prosciutto, and the experience of eating sweet prosciutto that you have made is going to be wonderful. We'll see you then, okay? Come back. We'll see, see you. See you next time. Bye-bye.